we have a shared crush, of course, is Lars Newtbar. I talk about this guy so much on the show and write him uh, write about him so much at scoopswithdannymac.com. Some people must think I've been like hired to write an autobiography, help him write an autobiography or something. But uh, I just like the idea of you, you, the way you laid it all out and that you share great enthusiasm about Lars Newtbar. So people need to go read that. Easy to find at fangraphs.com. But tell us, tell us why you think. Uh, Lars Newtbar is all that and more. Yeah, I'll give you the the short of it, and then I'll give you kind of the, the disclaimers. The short of it is pretty simple. I've seen a lot of talent evaluators describe it this way. There's really three things you need to do in baseball. You need to figure out which pitches you can hit, and then when you hit those, hit them hard, preferably in the air, and then don't swing the one, don't swing at the ones you can't hit. That's like there's a lot of tricky ways to do that. Baseball's not easy, but if you do those things, it's good. Um, who does those things really well? Lars Nidbar. Those are <laughs> those are basically the things that he does well on offense, and he does them very consistently. And now that he has more power, he's doing the hard part of it, which is doing a lot of damage when you connect well. You know, he's always walked a ton, and walking a ton is, you know is maligned for a reason. Sometimes it happens because the pitchers are wild. Sometimes it happens because of you. But with him, it certainly seems like it's happening because of him. He's he's running pretty high walk rates against guys who are, you know, really incentivized to get him out when he didn't have a lot of power. He really just has a great sense of the strike zone. And if you can do those two things, you're going to be a really good hitter. Uh, it's basically as simple as that. And that's, that's kind of the, the thesis behind why I like him so much. Hey, Ben... Let me play devil's advocate, except I'm not really a devil's advocate um, because I uh, my my uh, admiration for Newt Bar is all the things you said, you know, matches up with how I see him as well. But I'm going to pass along a couple things that were people to me making playing the devil's advocate role, which, OK, number one. Yeah, I know he gets on base a lot. See, see the sarcasm I'm using already. Uh yeah, he gets on base a lot. I get it. But uh, look how low his batting average is. All right, what, and, and there's truth to that. But is, is that a who cares thing? To me, it, it is because it's all about not making outs. But what do you make of the low batting average? Because some people are uh, somewhat obsessed with that. Yeah, I would say it's not a who cares thing. But I think that he makes up for it by doing other things. So... Batting average is not meaningless because you need, like, hits to get you on base, and it's great. But if you think of batting average as a way of getting some extra bases, some, like, base advancements, and some getting on base, then you could make up for singles with, like, a walk and a double, right? What would you rather have, two singles or a walk and a double? Eh, I don't know. It's probably pretty similar. I think I'd probably prefer the walk and the double. And Newt Bar slugs and gets on base, and so he's essentially creating these singles with walks and doubles, and he's creating a lot of them. And he's doing all that despite the fact that, I mean, he just did not do well when the ball was in play on the ground last year, which everyone knows is going to get a little bit easier. This year. So, yeah, yeah, good like, point. Yep. Batting average matters. Uh, you know, if he batted higher and thus got on base more, I'd like him more. But uh, he does a really good job of having pretty successful numbers despite a, like, yeah, like, obviously I'd like him more if he batted 250 and 250. But he's, he does the other stuff so well that he can be pretty valuable at 230. And if that stuff, just, if his batting average just bumps up a little bit, I mean, he already does everything else so well. There's, there's a lot of room on the outside there. And the other point of view from a so-called devil's advocate is this. Okay, we know. Granted, he was, uh, you know, from early July to the end of the regular season and into the postseason, the two games against the Phillies, he was he was a great hitter. He was great. But is that enough of a sample size to tell us that what he did during that time is repeatable uh, or at least close to being repeatable? Uh, I will say maybe. Um, maybe. I, I don't think it's we should just assume he's this good forever but projection systems which do a pretty good job of basically answering this question for us 
think that he's the third best hitter on the Cardinals this year. So in some ways, I'd say that I'm not really going out on a limb that much. I'm just telling you what the data that people have already put up looks like. And that looks like the skills that look the most stable over time, he's done well. The stuff that is a little bit more luck-based has held him back, has helped him a little and held him back a little, and it's kind of offset. And so going forward, with some you know natural regression, he's not going to have quite the power uh, year that he had in 2022, I don't think, for a full season. But even with a little bit of regression there, some just beneficial, just a few more singles landing, looks like it's going to make him one of the best hitters on the Cardinals, whether you're asking a bunch of computers or whether you're asking talent evaluators. Ben Clemens with us from Fangraphs, and we always appreciate his visits. Um, one more Newt Bar question. Uh, do, would you – listen, let me back up a minute. I, I'm sorry. I, I know that Molly Marmol likes to, you know, move pieces around. He's not a – I'm going to lock this guy into this batting, batting, batting order position, and that's it. He's, and he stays there. You know, it's, not, it's never going to be that way, and that's good. Mm. But do you like the idea of Newt Bar batting leadoff, given, um, given the, the, the on-base skill and obviously the danger of the power that he has? Yeah, I, I like him at the top of the lineup somewhere, like one through four somewhere. And given that I think Goldsman and Arnauto want to hit three, four, yeah. first is fine, second is fine. I'd like to have him just get more at bats. I think that's right. the, the long and short of it. Like, it's great that he's pretty fast. Um, it's great that he gets on base a lot. But I just want all our best hitters at the top of the line. So, that, that's, that's a good answer. Really, really, it is because you know I've I've kind of even though I like the idea of him and him at leadoff. I uh, Marmol's got so many choices and can really move things around. And I think if if people do their jobs as hitters. I mean, this will be one of the deep, deepest uh, Cardinals lineups that I can remember. And, again, it's a big if. I, I mean, we don't know exactly what to expect from O'Neill or Carlson. Or if Jordan Walker makes the team out of camp, you know, is it going to take him a while to get going? I mean, there's all these variables, obviously. But I, I really like what this lineup will be capable of. And so I wanted to uh, – well, one other quick question. What do you make of um, – Brendan Donovan's power now uh, and again it's spring training but we also know he put the work in to make it happen but you think this is something that's going to be there um, for this season um, a, a higher slugging percentage a much higher slugging percentage my general view is to take a wait and see approach in spring training I think that's paid off more often than not we'll say yeah. that him hitting the ball harder just physically harder is a good sign and definitely not going to hurt his like ability to make consistent contact. I would guess that he's going to have a little bit more extra base pop than he did in 2022 because he just had none. Like he even for him he had a remarkably low uh, you know just doubles and triples even. I I don't think it's going to continue to be quite so low. There's room to still be a like I don't know 20th percentile power hitter and still hit better for power than Donovan did. And I expect right. that to happen. It's just always, I think if you go into the year thinking, I'm going to take everything that I saw in spring with a grain of salt as a default view, you'll do okay. And hey, if he proves me wrong in April, great. I, I'm hoping so. But I think generally speaking, the right attitude to take towards these is, uh, you know, show me twice. No, I'm with you. I, I really am. It's, I love spring training, but I'm, I also get frustrated by it because it's it, even like an old dude like me. It's been around so long, you know, and I know better than to get carried away by spring training stats, good or bad. But sometimes I, I can't c control my instincts. You know, I'm just like, oh, yeah. look at this, you know, so. Uh, I know I almost want to watch less, but I do it less. <laughs> and I also want to watch it. You know. Uh, and I do think, and I talk about this a lot on the show, and I, I do think that the standards are different for, uh, you know, for players. So if you're someone really, really in a legitimate job battle to make the team and earn playing time and you're, you're pitted against other guys, uh, yeah, I, you better put up some numbers. If it is a true competition, you better put up some numbers in spring training. I could care less about what established, proven guys do, veterans uh, in spring training. I don't – if Nolan Arenado, you know, hits uh, – goes two for 22, I don't care. Same with Goldie. 
uh, how, the way Miles Michaelis pitches in spring training. You know, he's pitching great in the WBC, but it's like I really don't care. But guys that – if the Cardinals are going to portray, well, we've got all this competition going on, well, Alec Burleson, you better start hitting, right? Uh, yeah. Juan Yampez, you better crank it up. So, I mean, it's a, it, that's why it's frustrating because they're, 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 I, do, I do attach some, some importance to spring training stats depending on who the player is we're talking about. Yeah, so. I would say that to the extent that it's predictive, it's predictive for playing time. And that's like in close battles, look, if the team didn't have anything separating these two guys between the year, and that's what they're saying, hey, they're in a position battle. Like, of course, right. you just take the one who hits better. It's not completely meaningless. Right. And so if, if you're trying to figure out who's going to get playing time in close battles, it's very important how well people do in spring training. If you're trying to figure out whether Arnado is going to be 5% better or 5% worse this year, like you said, <laughs> No doubt. And this is, a, this is a good question. I mean, what we just talked about there sets up the next question because it does involve a, lot of, a number of guys that probably do have something to prove if they're going to earn the, the so-called lion's share playing time. And that would be the, the outfield situation. And I guess, number one, do you expect Jordan Walker to open the season with him, uh, barring some kind of collapse and, you know, gosh forbid, an injury? But do you, do you think Jordan, Jordan Walker's there on opening day? Man, I have to be honest with you. I just couldn't – like, I don't have any better view than anyone else on this. I'm going to say discretion is a better part of Valor here. I don't know. Like, it, I'm trying to picture how they wrap the team around getting him on the opening day roster, and they could. That's going to be at the expense, expense of – like, I don't know, Yepes or Gorman or something, right? Like, I, I haven't really aimed it out down to the last roster spot, but I think that there's pretty much no way that O'Neal, Carlson, and Newtbar aren't three of the four outfield plus DH slots. Right. Because they play pretty good defense and they have established major league track records. It doesn't hurt that Newtbar and O'Neal are two of the best players in the world baseball classic right now. So, to the extent that... Uh, You'd be worried that one of them had to get injured and collapse spring. It's not happening. Um, but I think it's really just going to come down to what the Cardinals think. And I haven't, I haven't seen enough reporting of, you know, the way that the team is thinking about it to have a have a really informed view that I feel good about telling you. Hey, oh, I know. Yeah, I no it, problem. Yeah, it seems I, to me they that they just tell him to go back to triple and like. Yeah. <laughs> He's he. I, I trust he'd be up pretty soon after, thereafter anyway. Yeah. But, and I also think if it is if you the, you know l- let's say the primary four guys you know Walker um, O'Neill Carlson and Newtbar, yeah. With the DH, I mean, there's plenty there's plenty of plate appearances to go around. You know, it's not like whoever is not in the starting lineup on opening day hypothetically, just a hypothetical. Uh, Dylan Carlson it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean he's going to like be sitting on the bench all season. I think there's a lot of work to go around there, and they got they got 300 plate appearances last year from guys who are no longer on the team uh, at at DH. 300 DH appearances um, that need to be filled, and I would think all those outfielders at some point will will get some time at DH. Uh, just the way Marmol has given time to Arenado and Goldschmidt at DH last season. Yeah, I'm also really curious. I think. The person who has a leg up on getting the most playing time is whoever ends up playing center. And I think it's Carlson because it seemed like the team liked him the most in center last year. But <laughs> O'Neill and Nudbar are both playing center for their teams. And they're not like bad teams with bad defenses. So clearly they're like reasonable center fielders. They've both looked the part. It's not obvious who the Cardinals' best center fielder is, but they're all really good. So like, any of the three who gets stuck in a corner will probably do quite well there. But I do think that whoever ends up, because the team will have like a primary center. This guy, we like him the most. He's going to play center. I think that guy's going to have a leg up on playing time. Just yeah. It's easy to plug that into the lineup every day. and then. Um, ben, one more thing. And thanks for your time today. Um, I'm not sure Mason Wynn has, at least among Cardinals fans, hasn't gotten more attention uh, than Jordan Walker. I mean, Jordan Walker deserves all the attention he's getting, but Mason Wynn in some ways has upstaged him, uh, at least over the last couple weeks. So I'm I'm probably telling you something you already know. I mean, there is a uh, it's almost fierce passion 
oh, he wins got to he's got to be on the team in opening day, you know. And they of course point pointed Paul DeYoung as the uh, the source of every everything bad. You can't have Paul DeYoung blocking him. Well, Paul DeYoung's not block, blocking him. I'm Tommy Edmonds, their shortstop. Yeah. So it's really hard to con- convince people it's going to be best for Mason Wynn to start the season in the minors. And Paul DeYoung has nothing to do with that. It, he just doesn't. If Wynn can't play up here right away all the time, it's detrimental to him. So help me, help me talk some logic into these good people. Yeah. Um. I guess I would I would basically just put it this way. The the person that you're wondering about whether Mason Wynn should start over is Brendan Dock. And I don't know, you you could convince me that that's the case, but it would be crazy to have a guy like Mason Wynn who yeah, I'm I'm with you. He is probably the future shortstop of the Cardinals. He's a, he has a chance to be, you know, like a perennial all star. Defensively, I think he's already ready. The question is just going to be, can he hit, right? Like, he was a league average hitter in double-A for 500 plate appearances last year. That might not play in the majors. Now, he's looked pretty good. He's looked quite good in training, really. But, like we said, it's not super useful predictably. Mason Wynn is young, and he's going to have a role in the Cardinals for a long time. And if they really think that right now his bat is better than Brendan Donovan, then he should be in the main. Like, he should just be playing short. Edmund should play second. And Donovan should be the utility guy. And that's that. But if they think that Mason Wynn's bat is not better than Donovan, and uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption. You know, he's, he's not played above double A, and he didn't tear the cover off the ball there. Uh, projection systems think he's going to be like 20% below average offensively if he had to play in the majors for a whole season. Yeah, why, and why do you want to do that? Like, yeah, let him play another season of the minors and then come up. It's fine. Yeah, it, it would be. It, it would really work against him. And I'm. I can never say 100% for sure, but I I would be really stunned uh, if the Cardinals put Win on the opening day roster because I know what they're thinking about him. They would really like to see him. More, more developmental time, you know. Uh, they're yeah. excited by him, but that's really not the point. Every, they were excited about him before spring training, and he's, he's a big part of their future, but it's pretty, I think it'd be really detrimental not to give him some time, at least at AAA. I mean, maybe maybe another almost full season, but we'll find out. We'll see. I'm with I, you. Like, I'm not saying it can't work out, but no. it's just more risk than you need to take. Like, it really is the case that if you put a guy well beyond his developmental level, it's no good for them. Look at the, the careers of guys who are just massively pushed with Rule 5 pick. Tough, you know? If you're right. just overmatched, it's no fun. It's, it's bad for your development. The reason that we're talking about this with Jordan Walker is because that is the case. He was overmatching his opponent. Like, he was just That's way right. too the levels he was playing at. When it was like, you know, treading water and being an incredible defender, it's usually good for people's development to kind of move up on that curve. And if he's obliterating AAA, he's, you know, 20% above average offensively after three or four months, I think he'll be in the majors. Just, uh, I think it's better for him to figure that out at AAA than to figure it out when, if he has a bad two weeks, Cardinals fans are calling up saying, get this bump back to the minors, get Donovan back in there. Ben Clemens, uh, you can follow him on Twitter at underscore ben underscore clemens c-l-e-m-e-n-s thanks as always for your time um i love talking cardinals baseball with you i really do i look forward to your visit so thanks again thanks brother see you that's ben clemens here on uh, the bernie show so yeah i never you know and we gotta get to a break because i'm uh, i'm just lagging today with uh oh we're good we're, um, we're good I never thought about it the way he presented it with actually if Mason wins on the opening day roster, it actually, it, it, it actually impacts Brendan Donovan more than anybody. It's a great point. I never thought about it. That's why he's Ben Clemens. I, it, as soon as he said it, I went, wow, yeah, where's he going to play that? You know, it, yeah. it, it's because. And you can move him around, but, you know, but he, would he be an everyday player even if he's moving around? Yeah. I, I don't know. You got Gorman at second, and you, if you have win there, then you go. Well, Tommy Edmonds got to play somewhere, and then you're still trying to play four outfielders for three spots. That's just a lot of moving around. You like options, but that may be yeah. too many. And I think I don't think Alec Burleson's done enough to make the team. And no, nope. so because people say, "Oh, you can't send him back to AAA. He dominated their last." Well, in a highly competitive environment, 
where they have to make some tough choices. I mean, he can't hit 180 in spring training. It's that's as simple right. as that. And he controls that. Yes, it, you that's know, the bottom so line here. That's the whole point of a competition. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm adamantly against any scenario that puts Nolan Gorman at AAA to start the season. That's I, I just think that, that that's crazy, um, especially if we go with what Derek Gould was telling us yesterday, and I'm glad he did. The Cardinals, the Cardinals view Gorman. It's like I, I, it was a great perspective on this. To recap what he said, the Cardinals, in effect, look at Gorman as like, look, Last year, we didn't want to DH you all that much because we, you're, you're learning a new position. You got to play at second base. You got to go through the trials and tribulations there. You got to, and then you got to get better at it. Then you get in the off season and you work on it. You get better at it. So he's made enough progress defensively to where they feel, more, you know, a lot more comfortable about using him as a DH. Now, if that's their attitude, because I thought they were reluctant, but that was last season. I think. And I rely on Derek Gould's reporting. If, if the Cardinals now look at Gorman and said, look, he doesn't have to play second base. Now, I don't know how well he would handle the DH position early, but once he adapts to it, but they're going to use him in second base. They're going to use him at third base, but they're going to use him a lot at DH, and that makes perfect sense. But that's also a reason why any talk of sending him to Memphis is just flat out nuts. Yeah, it's I, nuts. I, 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 he, that's for me. That's not an option. I mean, if if Nolan Gorman was hitting 100 right now and getting an opportunity and just not hitting, I say okay, send him back. But right. that's not the case. He's hitting the ball well. Right. He, he plays here. He's a major league baseball player right now. He's at that level. He deserves to be in the big leagues. And you just roll with it and fit him in where you want to fit him in. He he's deserved that. So he he can start a lot of games a second. He can start some for Nolan Arrow at third. And going final thought on this before we get to a break. I, I would I would actually like, and I know they have a glut of outfielders now. I, I would like like it if the Cardinals started a process at some point this season. Maybe get him in the outfield, shag and fly balls. I, I, I'd yeah. like just to to make him even more flexible. I agree. Look, he he runs well enough, and he's a smart enough player. If you needed him to play a corner outfield, he could learn how to do it, and, and very quickly, I think. You I know. think so too. Yeah. So why not make some, give him more versatility? But that's not anything right away.